I am, my name is Michael, I come from heaven. I am uh, a son of God, and my purpose on the earth is to bring more sons into glory and destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. And all of my life is given to multiply the same purpose into everyone that I speak with. That they also will bring sons into glory. And just by their very presence, even all of you that are here, destroying the works of the devil. Amen? So if you can imagine being out in a desert, or just sitting out here on the road somewhere in Mumbai, when the temperature is uh, 32, 33, 34 degrees, I have to sit down? No, no, he's working on it. You going to get it? Yeah, I gotta stand. I sit down, I'll fall asleep. <laughs> so it, you imagine your body just being that hot. No breeze or anything, and just that hot. And somebody came up with an ice cube and just put that ice cube right on your knee. And you close your eyes. And the amazing thing about it is that that little touch of that cold on your knee would refresh your whole body. Now, you are, I am, we are, the body of Jesus. And the reality of that, we'll talk about that tonight a little bit. First thing I want to kind of make fun of is that you get to look at yourself tonight. <laughs> Let me see. That's like, you, do you see yourself in the mirror? Oh, you're so lucky. Now, these people over here got to be looking at themselves, thinking about how dead they are. <laughs> dead bodies, a bunch of dead bodies. Yeah, let the dead bury the dead. Now, Sunday, we went into some areas that I want to really encourage you to go back over it, listen carefully, and write down. Because there's areas of the Word of God for your soul that's been opened up into new areas. New areas of the mind of Christ, the way you would think about yourself. And tonight, we're going to do some more. Because, see, to grow up into the measure and the fullness of Christ is not to remain a little baby in it anymore. The foundation that has been laid is actually the most solid foundation that I've seen in 50 years that, that Pri has done in your souls. And... and uh, <coughs> All, all of the other leaders around the world that I relate to, I, I've got them all. So you've got to go, and you've got to go through what Prius laid down, and get, get, get those sheets printed out, and see where there are holes in the foundation of the sonship of the people you're ministering to. Because a lot of the people came out of religion, pastors and bishops and prophets and apostles, and they come into sonship, but they still carry in a lot of the old stuff. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but some of the songs you sing, I can't sing those songs. Because as you sing those songs, it separates you from God. And yet he's the one come in you to be one with you. So you can't allow that separation. You have to surrender to being him. Now, you're not the fullness of Jesus, but he is the fullness of you. And he's come into this temporary time, into the male, into the female, into the young, into the old, okay, to live a life preparing that interchamber, that inner sanctuary, okay, as a bride. 
So when you begin to see yourself in a way, for example, we don't bow down before the Lord. That, that's something out of the Jewish religion, something out of separation from God. I'm not, how's my foot going to bow down to me? Hello? <laughs> I mean, just simple little stuff like that. You know, how are we going to see? So in celebration, and I still work on it because we have like four different worship teams there. And uh, the, the, whoever does the singing during that worship session uh, is, is in charge of, of all the words. They have to, they got them. So they got a big book about that thick of all kinds of, all kinds of songs. And all these songs are awesome. And we've all sang them. And they make us feel so good. But some of them are, are not for us anymore. So what did we do? Change the words because the tune is so cool. Makes us feel so good. But we changed the words so that we would just take out the separation as we're talking. Now, here's the promise of the Lord. My blood is going to cleanse you from everything that's unrighteous. And the Holy Spirit, through my blood, is going to separate you from completely the old man. The identity of the male, the female, the Indian, the human. This is a promise. Now, more than just what we think about a promise, <coughs> a promise to God is a covenant. And he established covenants. First, his word said this. Nothing can change his word. But then the people that were, fell into sin they had a choice to obey his word and receive his promise or not receive his promise. He gave that word to Adam, to Eve. Then came Abraham. Now, the reason he brought the law, the law of sin and death introduced into the world was because in the word of God, it says when the word enters into us it brings light now the thing about the word of God coming into you it exposes darkness that's why we look at the darkness and we say no now the apostle Paul worked for years as the Lord was working with him in his development as a son he had a lot of outer works to do. His job and the first apostles, their job was to lay the foundation of Jesus dying, being crucified, and raised up. In all of their epistles, all of their works, they gave you the big picture. Raised up and seated with Christ. That's who you are now. But then they had to bring it into temporary time down into the time in which they lived. So, okay, here's these women in the church, and he, he puts the word down there, says, I don't suffer the woman to teach. Tell the women to be quiet in church. Do you know why he had to do that? It wasn't some law rule. He wrote it's because <laughs> the women were uneducated, but when they got the Holy Spirit... They just went nuts. And they, they couldn't stop. Settle down, honey. Settle down. And he's teaching. And he's speaking some things that they never heard before. And she says, honey, what is he saying? What's he talking about? I don't understand that. Let him just learn at home. In other words, quit interrupting the service. That's the only reason for the law. That's the only reason why he put those rules down. It wasn't to bring anybody into bondage. It was to have order. 
so that it wouldn't be out of order. Right? We are the in generation. I'm still here on the earth. I've told my close friends, I said, you know, I, 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 Father, take me home. I am sick of this place. And you know what he said to me? I am telling you, I went at, at years and years and years. Have you ever read the book of Ecclesiastes? It tells you almost everything there is about the world. And you know what it says about it? It's all worthless and vanity. Okay? So I said, okay, how do I live in this crazy place? Especially after I've been to heaven and I know what's in store for us there. And this is what he said, Michael, enjoy the vanity. You're going to be there for a while. Now listen carefully. In learning to let him be, I am dead. My life is hid in Christ. That's the word. That's a promise. That's a covenant. And if I want to agree with that, I can have that. If I don't want to agree with that, it doesn't, I don't get it. That's what he does with covenants. He made a covenant before they ever came into the, to the earth, an eternal covenant between the Father and the Son, a covenant in which God would become a human sperm. The body of a baby has the blood of the Father. A covenant in blood. The blood of Jesus, eternal life manifested in physical, temporary time. A covenant. Now I want to... Strip away the body of Jesus, the natural man of Jesus, as you're looking into your natural man here. Thinking about his soul. I mean, he had eternal life, but he doesn't walk around glowing all the time. His body had eternal life. He couldn't die. But then when that body did die, he came back up out of the tomb, walked on the planet for 40 days. Now listen carefully. <coughs> Four, not on anything, not on anything. It's, it's, it's just the temperature here. It's just the care. Forty days, he walked around in a body exactly like the Word of God says your body is. For you were crucified with Christ. Now you take that by faith. His promise is you were crucified with me. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to take everything that I've got and give it to you. So in his body, he was dead. Then the Spirit moved, brought him up out of the grave, and was the power of that life. The Apostle Paul worked at it for years and years and years. It was his goal while he was here on the earth. Forget the things that are past, pressed on, <coughs> that I might attain unto eternal life. Re resurrection life, not glorified life. He wanted to be so manifested, to have so much of the death of Jesus manifested that the life of Jesus could also be manifested. So, for years and years and years, the Holy Spirit was working on him. <clears throat> you know, I kept reading this, this word called heart. Old Testament, New Testament. Talk about heart. And so, 
I got out one of those big, strong concordance that I used to have. About We've got them on our phones now, if you can get one. It was about this big and that thick, having every word in the Bible, and where that word was, and then the Greek and the Hebrew of what that word actually meant. So I'm looking at an English word called uh, heart. And so I'd ask this apostle, and he says, well, heart. Well, he didn't know what a heart was. Oh, that's another theologian guy. What's the heart? Well, that's your spirit. I said, well, that's interesting. Now, let's take the vine, a picture of a vine. You got it in your imagination. Here's the vine. The vine represents eternal life. Then comes a little branch off of the vine, and that represents soul. It also represents temporary life, because all of the operation of that branch is to produce fruit, and it goes through changes in different seasons. But the vein part of the vine says the same. I am the vine, you are the branch, you're the fruit producing one, you're the fruit bearing ones of the branch. So I said, okay, now so I, I get that, Lord. What's the deal with the heart? Well, the natural science mind can come up and say, well, it's, it's the part in your body. It's just, a, it's a pump. It moves your blood around. Others think, well, that's the center of your being. And I said, what is actually the heart? And the first scripture he brought me to was that we were not circumcised with the circumcision made by man, but we were circumcised with the circumcision of Christ, a circumcision of the heart. Now, the thing that I learned about our father, as a son, he began to show me what he does because everything that he does, he's going to show you that you can do it. See, when you're a little baby, you don't need to do anything. Your parents take care of you. And the, that's the foundation. You are a son. You have a father. You have a destiny in this life. He's already got it set up in front of you. But you know something? He wants you to grow as a mature son to be able to do. You're not going to be a king in heaven, sitting around going, Father, what, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? You're not going to be a priest eternally. You're going to learn how to do those things. Because what he does, and this is what Jesus said, the Father loves the Son. He shows the Son everything that he does, that the Son might do them also. So Sunday I opened up some of the areas for you. See, there's lots of that New Testament word that is not alive in you. No, it's okay. Because we're just beginning here as a body. Everybody individually is growing at different rates. But as a body, in one mind, one accord, okay, we're going to grow up into power beyond anything you ever dreamed of. Now, how did God do what he does? I've got, I don't know how many people are in here, but uh, let me get somebody to just pass these out. I want you to hold on to these. Don't look at them. Just pass them around. I, I think there's only 20 of them. And so uh, uh, you can make some copies. That I, I give this to you, and I don't want you to look at it right now, and everybody's looking at it right now. You're going to give me 500 rupees. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, just to hold on to them, that's where we got them passed out. <clears throat> now, everything the Father does, I don't have enough, you guys can share them, it, you know, I'm going to share it. But everything the Father does, He wants us to understand how He does it. For example, you know you have a living kingdom. As a son, we're going to, we're inheriting that kingdom. And as a son, we're going to learn how to be kings in this kingdom. Jesus is going to show us how to do it. 
The Holy Spirit's going to take what is his and impart it to us. Now, one of the things that Jesus said about the Father, and you can go back into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just look at the scripture. Just take the red letter in the Bible and look at the things that Jesus says about the Father. See, it is the Son that reveals the Father. What are the, one of the things he said is, the Father is the husbandman. Given those, a, a revelation that he's like a farmer. Like, like, like someone that's raising a crop. Like someone that's growing something. Very interesting. Didn't Jesus say that he was like a seed? And he had to die in order to multiply? Okay. So everything the Father has done from the beginning of the time... When we were slain in Christ, the Lamb was slain. We are part of the Lamb. And that's a whole other area that's opened up to you right now. I'm going to open it up. You have to ask the Holy Spirit. He'll show you. We got scattered throughout the entire creation. Now we're being gathered back together again. Hallelujah. Now, why can't I tell you that? How many of you know that you're born again? That you're born of God? Did you read where it also said you are born of the word of God? What do you think that makes you? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It makes you the word of God. How much of the word of God are you? As much of the life of Jesus you have in you. That's how much of the word of God you are. And in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. In other words, we are born to be sons of the Father. Just like Jesus. But he's the firstborn. Preeminent. Eh? Alright, so let's say, let's take the... Uh, the operation of Jesus toward all of the dead people in the world at the time. And he had, uh, nobody understood anything he was saying. But so let's take a little bit of history and let's think about it. Okay, what was the world like back then? Well, the women, 99% of them weren't educated. Most of the men weren't educated. Okay. Death was everywhere. Uh, the average lifespan was about 35 years old and, and you had wars and the Romans and the persecution and, and just diseases and fear. it was a mess back there. So the fear of death was a big thing because everybody knew they didn't have long to be here. So here he comes into the scene into temporary time looking like a personal human person. They didn't understand anything he said. They were in the absolute gulf of darkness. The Jewish people's minds were totally darkened to anything of the reality of life. Now there's a shadow and a type of the things we read in the Old Testament about what they do. They're like a type and a shadow of something that is light, that is a truth. But it's hard to see the truth when you're buried under the shadow. So Jesus said, come on, you guys. Um, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Because they were fishing for fish. <clears throat> How is he going to make them <coughs> fishers of men? By being an example. <coughs> Now the words that he was speaking, many of the words that he was speaking <clears throat> died on the cross with him. The words of darkness, it died with him on the cross. The eternal word of God comes out of that darkness into glorification. You got it? In other words, the seed has to die Remember, he spoke his word like a seed, but it has to die in order for it to come forth into life. 
And the father is the husbandman. He is the gardener. For all of the, he called them his sheepfold. Bah, bah, taking care of the sheep. He called them his vineyard. Producing a fruit. Producing a crop. Season after season after season. Now the crop was not in the flesh, it was in the soul. So that from one generation to the next, what was produced in the soul would go into the next generation. If this generation were a bunch, went back into idolatry, well, then judgment would come down. Okay? And this next generation would be living and bearing the fruit of that idolatry. Sheepfold, and then an olive tree. Given us a representation about the fact that God grows things. The lamb was slain, and the life went out into all of creation. The word was spoken. Same thing. The lamb being slain, and God saying the first word is, is the same thing. The same thing. For his word to go forth out of him, the lamb, the purest of the pure of all of God, had to die. Now I'm talking about your father. But I'm also helping you to see in a reflection who you are, who you have been for eternity, but you haven't been on the earth, only in the last couple of years. And we are an awake, beloved church. We are awake. I turned on this air conditioner because I know that, try to put you to sleep. And you are an understanding church because what I'm saying to you as I'm saying it, you fully understand what I'm saying. Whether you remember it or not later is not that important. Okay? Because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Okay? So our Father created amazing things in the very beginning as the word went forth and it popped open. There was a, a, an incredible, pristine universe. Absolutely pure. Absolutely wonderful. And this was before Lucifer was cast down. When he was cast down, came down into this physical time, and the whole place went to hell. So in chapter 1, verse 1, it was pure. It was all good. In chapter 2, it was chaos. And everything that God did from that point, he did, he created it out of something that already existed. Before, he created everything out of himself. He sowed the seed. Laid in the law of seed, time, and harvest. A law of the universe. Okay, you know what the law of the spirit of life is? That's the one we've come into now when we came out, from, out of sin, out of the world. The law of the spirit of life in Christ. What is that law? Well, it's pretty simple. Nothing can exist in the kingdom of God unless it's alive with the life of God and nothing can be in the kingdom of God unless it multiplies that life. See, the kingdom is an ever increasing kingdom an eternally multiplying life. Hallelujah. So every one of the members of the, of the kingdom of God all have an ability to multiply. No way multiplication like the way the animals do on the earth the way humans do on the earth and the multiplication that, that whole realm is totally different the multiplication of life ever increasing kingdom ever increasing 
seed time and harvest. As long as the sun and the moon are there, there's seed time and harvest on the earth. All right, is this pretty clear? Okay, so <coughs> the principle working in the kingdom of God, the law of life that's here. It's not the law of sin and death, but there's a law of life that works here. And it goes this way. Whatever anyone sows, that's what they will reap. Now this is true in every facet of existence. In our world of humans, whatever anyone sows, that's what they will reap. Now we've been taken out of the sphere of death where all they can do is sow death and reap death. These physical bodies are in that process. It was sown in death, it'll reap death. But we've been delivered from that darkness into the kingdom of light. And the Father wants to show us how he does what he does. Now the first thing I want you to have an identification with as a son is that one of the most precious spirits that I've ever come into personal relationship with is the spirit of faith. It is a living spiritual being created from the very beginning that the father used to do exactly what the scripture says it does. What does faith do? It is the substance of what is hoped for. See, before the lamb was slain, before the word went forth, there was seed coming forth out of the, the father was having a vision, a dream, a hope. See, the seed is the hope. And the life comes to it to bring it into being by a spirit of faith. How much confusion is the spirit of faith? You got faith? Oh, I got faith. Faith is big. You can't do anything here in the world, even in the carnal way, without having some faith that you can do it. Having faith that we are, a, we are an awake church. I saw you. I saw, I saw her yawning. I don't blame you. I can't sit down here. <laughs> I, I've been caught when somebody else is preaching. I'm sitting down there. But I just tell them, oh, I'm, I'm older. <laughs> oh, so, I'm sorry, Carl. Okay. Now you got me totally off the track, see? It wasn't. It was all your fault. <clears throat> Sons, as he is, so are you here. That as long as you're looking at that person, you can't see that as he is, so are you here. You don't get to see him, but you're, you're in it. You can see. <laughs> so, we just keep our eyes on him. As he is, so are we. Number one, hey, listen. I have given them, Father, the glory that you gave to me before the foundation of the, I've given it unto them. So what are you doing talking about? All glory belongs to you out there somewhere. Hello, singing a song. Now this is different because it's going to change you. Now when I go back to that vine and that branch, the branch is the soul, but what's the heart? I was looking for a plant, okay? So we take any kind of plant, these plants out there. <clears throat> there is a place where every little branch connects into the bigger branch. A little bitty, bitty ring of cells that is the actual, the cells connect both the big branch and the little branch. 
connects the vine and the branch, a little row of cells. And between your soul and the spirit, when we were dead in our sin, that little group of cells was hard. Hardened. It couldn't take any life out of the vine because it was hard. And so we were circumcised. If I was the craftsman, I would go out here on these trees and I could graft in that tree into that tree by having a precise cut right at that cell and then on the other side and graft it in. And that's the heart. So that now you're able to into that branch and start bearing the fruit. The soul is made up of the mind and the will and the emotions. And the New Testament is full. The Old Testament is full of revelation of the soul. Now before we got born again, as good as your little soul was, some of you were real goody goodies. Some of you, like, like my brother Joy and I, we were not very good. Man, we were so bad. If God hadn't pulled us out of hell, whew, we'd be dead in doornails. We'd be dead, gone. Because what we were sowing, we were going to reap it quickly. But some of you have been realized, as good as you were, you're still dead. But in the crucifixion of Christ, where you died with him, circumcised you. Cut away the dead part so that that heart could receive the life again. And that's what's going into your soul. Second Peter 1 4. We are given exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. You are born again. You are a son of God. All of the blessings and the promises of the eternal life that you have in the spirit are already yours. You are a fathered son throughout eternity. They're already yours. So because you're a son, he sends the spirit into your soul. <clears throat> and power comes in there to transform that soul to be like Jesus. And the day will come when these bodies are going to change in the moment of a clink of an eye to be just like Jesus. So what is he doing with this? He's working on the soul. The word of promise for the soul. So, what does the word tell us to do? Remember, we are hearers of the word, you know, and doers of the word. It says to be not conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you've learned already that the beginning of the renewal of your mind. Now, here's the mind. It, it's a beautiful thing that God had created, totally corrupted by the sin of the flesh. But now the life has come into the soul and beginning to transform it into the mind of Christ. See? That's what's happening. And so there's a lot going on. It's not about knowing a thousand scriptures. It's about faith in his promises. By these exceeding great and precious promises, we become partakers of that nature. Now the foundation that you've received is that I have the nature of God. But look in the mirror. Do you see it? How much did you see it today on the set? How much? Well, you know, whoa. So John comes up and tells us the truth. Now we are the sons of God 
but we don't have any idea what that is. That's what he says. We don't have any idea what that's going to be like. But every day, day after day, week after week, we begin to see the operation by faith, the blood of Jesus cleansing you from something. Yeah? Some of you, you guys watch movies? This is Bollywood land, yeah? You watch movies? Yeah. I mean, movies are full of crap. Enjoy the vanity. But what happens, because there's so much junk in them sometimes, you know, the blood is faithful to cleanse you, to separate you from it, okay? But then it goes over and over and over and over again, day after day after day. After day. We don't go and sin willfully so that then we know we can repent, we're going to be okay. No, we don't want to do that. We want to grow in that precious promise. <clears throat> Renewing our mind into our identity as a son. And that's what you've been doing. And your confessions of the I am scriptures and the, and the now I am and the, and, the son, and the little sonship book and, and all your stuff, I am a son. And you're, you know, you are, okay, transforming the identity in your mind. So you are a son of God. And through another part of the body that has had intercession, Life has come into you. And you're learning that the more of that life that you get, the more you give. Is that right? No, it's not right. Jesus said, give and you will receive. They had nothing. They were out in the wilderness with no food. They had nothing. He said, give and you shall receive. Sow a seed and you shall reap a harvest. The whole principle of giving life, not like religion, Religion has taught people to sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Poor little people. Oh, look at that little lady. She put a little penny in the... She gave more than all these rich guys. She's still dead. What was he making the point about? <laughs> she was hopeless and had nothing and gave it into the bucket out of some law in her mind. Or that the rich people, that they put their money in the bucket. It really didn't make a lot of difference when you begin to look at it. But he made an example. Okay? And of course, you've read it. Maybe somebody preached on it. And you, you feel very humble about that. <laughs> Jesus was a master. He knew men. He knew women. He understood them to the core. And so he goes over here and he just heals this people here and he heals that one there and he casts that demon out over there. And all these people are watching because he's got a hook into that person. And he reels and starts reeling them in. See, the signs and the wonders and all that he did. These people were dead in their sin, carnal-minded, had no idea what he was saying. Take the beam out of your own eye before you start judging your brother. They didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Fishing. Catching fish. He said, I'm going to show you how to catch fish. Put the net over on the other side of the boat. In other words, it wasn't just one fish at a time. It was a whole slug of them. But then what did he do? You pull it up on the land. He said, you catch a bunch of fish, pull up on the land, and you throw out the ones that are no good. That's his job. Our job is to look for sons. <clears throat> His job was to look for the lost of Israel 
which he found. And the Holy Spirit brought them into the kingdom. And then these brothers began to lay the foundation of the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection. But they were so carnal. That's why all those rules and regulations came up. See, because you're the righteousness of God, son. And there is absolutely nothing against you. No laws of man, no laws of sin and death have any authority or power over you. If you want to go out here and kill somebody, your father's not going to see you any different than he says, you are my righteousness. That's exactly what he gave to Abraham. Abraham could have done anything he wanted because you're right with God. Well, who's God? I mean, still... <laughs> Men for centuries have been trying to make God to be out like them. Or some other crazy stuff they got in different countries, worlds. Your father has given you the righteousness by birth. By the covenant of the blood. By the heredity of the blood. By the inheritance of the blood. So there are a lot of scriptures in the New Testament that you should look at that are promises concerning the working of the blood. Precious promises that as you're partaking of them, as you're believing to receive them, as you are agreeing with God to have them, cause your soul to take on the nature of God. The life of Jesus comes in through those words that come alive. Now the word comes alive with you and I as doers. Like learning to ride a bicycle. You see the older kids doing it. You see them riding down there and they're having such a good time and you believe you can do it. And you've got the zeal to do it. So you go ask daddy to give you a bicycle or your neighbor. And you get on a bicycle and you run into the back of the car. You fall over. You know, the, the rickshaw almost runs over you. But you get back up. And you keep doing it. You're walking by some faith inside of you that you're going to get on that bicycle. Well, that's the way the word is. That's how the word comes to our soul and actually manifesting itself it comes as a seed into a ground it comes into the mind like a ground I am a son of God I've been in this for 50 years and I am barely 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 scratching the surface of the reality of what that means but after all these years, you can imagine what you think about yourself and how much you live in a realm of sonship as a king and a priest. You know, 50 years later, I'm still saying I am just a baby. Anything I think that I know, I don't know anything yet as I should know. But I do know. I do have some. Now, what should, we're going to go on here. Promises. Luke 16, 10. Okay. Now, I am not going to give you a bicycle. I'm not going to give you any responsibility until I prove that you're going to be faithful. He that is faithful in that which is least will also be faithful in that which is much. Things mentioned below are the least. And will be mentioned in those. Enjoy. Everything else you're doing. Your purpose for existence, for him calling you and quickening that life of sonship in you, the purpose for you doing that is to multiply more sons. Bring more sons into glory. <clears throat> See, in helping you understand who you are as a son, it immediately begins to destroy all of the works of the devil that he's been working on you for years. Because everything is in your identity. In your identity as a human, as an Indian, as a male, as a female. All of that leads to death. All leads to death. It's all identity. 
So teaching us to give will also be trained to be life-giving souls. Talk about giving. I'm telling you, the devil's got such a stronghold on the believers because of all kinds of religious stuff about giving. But I want you to know everything he teaches you about giving, the desire to give, it's all in transforming that soul to be a life-giving soul. Now, giving doesn't mean that you're empty. Because you're constantly receiving from the vine. And the vine is bringing life into the seeds of the promises in your souls. <laughs> promises. Okay. He's given us all things to enjoy on the earth. All good things. I mean, what are bad things? Well, you were doing the bad things before. Now you don't necessarily want to do them so much anymore. That rhymes, didn't it? <laughs> All right. So, to transform us to be life giving souls, we don't know how to do that. So, we have to take the very least, the very least. And Jesus was talking to those people because, see, those people were under extreme bondage of poverty. Mentally, intellectually, just poverty, curse of death, of poverty. So I'm going to go over to the back part here. We're going to go into tithes. See, the tithe didn't start with the law, and the tithe has nothing to do with the law of sin and death. The tithe has to do with the eternal covenant of God. It came up as a fruit out of who? You got it, Abraham. Oh, you're doing it again. <laughs> Everybody saw you that time. Yeah, okay, unfold your legs, move your arms around. I'm picking on you. I, 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 I love her so much, I, I tell you, man. It's just, it's all. I, I raised four. I raised four girls, and I tell you what, I, I love, I love, I love sons of God in female bodies because they are really interesting people. <laughs> Hallelujah! Loving the vanity. See, how, how, how can I love you? I don't even know you. I, I love you because by faith I see Jesus in you, and then that makes me one with you, and that makes me want to know you. Why do I want to know you? Why? Because I want to give to you the life that I've got. Why would I want to give to you the life? Why would you want to give? Give. Why? The only purpose for giving is so that you can receive. No sacrifice. We're not, <laughs> no. He didn't take his word and just throw it out there. Okay, whatever. No. Isaiah 55 says, I send my word forth with a purpose and it will perform what I send it forth to do and it will be multiplied back to me from the beginning. Sowed with a full expectation of receiving. The farmer goes out, sows the seed. Then he's got to wait patiently for it to grow to get the harvest. You know, the herdsman's got to go out and take care of the flock so that the new crop comes up every year. Hey, there, the, the devil's a liar. You know, he's got all of these believers, all of these years, even now. Now, I started with this years and years and years ago. And when I started going out overseas, I was pissed off when I saw how poor, not just in money, poor in life. See, life 
is more valuable than anything. And the more you give of it, the more you get of it. Hallelujah. And it, you don't have to be a, a preacher or a teacher or... Hey, you got all the opportunities anybody else does. Our job is a little harder than yours. Because we got to go through a lot of changes to be able to share this life through us. To give it to you. We, we didn't just show up here and so, say, okay, you know. Not coming out of our heads. We went through a lot of breakings and a lot of trials to hold on to our identity as sons and to let these covenant promises work. Doers of the word. All right, so let's, let's go over here real quick. Matthew and Malachi. Here's the word. Uh, will a man rob God, yet you've robbed me? You say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Now, how do you rob God? How can you rob God? He's, he's our Father. He loves us. How can you rob me? Well, you can steal from me by not letting me love you. That's how they were robbing from God. They were not letting him bless them. She, uh, Priya said it, I don't know if it was uh, on the teaching on ties that you did, but where all of a sudden you realized that you wanted to tithe because you loved God. Because you loved him. That's exactly what Abraham did. He was already super rich. It wasn't about getting more riches. It was about giving his life, his success, his victory as a tithe, you know, to Melchizedek. See, everything the Father has for us is because he loves us. But this thing about giving, see, giving. And what is the least of the least? Well, it's, it's where you get it out of the sweat of your brow. The money realm. The whole world. You know, all your Bollywood movies are all based upon self-centered junk. Now, your sons, and all I'm doing is showing you who you are. While you're looking at your dead self, I'm telling you about who the living self is. You don't compare yourself to anyone. Okay? But you begin to do the word in the least. A tithe is a worship to God. You've got that down. Okay? We're out there in the world, the Christian world. They, I was in Africa. Oh my gosh! And bishop and prophet and 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 uh, I'm talking to him about this. And I said, "Well, who do you tie to?" Oh, I, I tie to the bishop. Who do you tie? Oh, I tie to the church. And, and I said, "Has it ever done you any good?" And they go, oh, "No, I don't think so." They at least they were honest. I said, well, that's because you've been doing it all wrong. And when I shared with what happened, woo, it blew their minds how they've been doing it for 25, 30 years. Hallelujah. So we worship God. Then you bring the, the material things into the storehouse so that the fellowship has what it has use for and abundance left over for every good work. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. All right, so the covenant is both obedience and faith. Jesus said, give and it shall be given. So you shall reap. Okay? It's not about sacrifice. Okay? And it's not about obedience that God's going to beat you up or be mad at you. He gives you this principle because he loves you, because he wants you to have blessings. That's what he wants you to have. 
So this was uh, written to these guys, so uh, let's read it, okay? The Lord has made provision for his ministers, the ministers. See, in the scripture, according to if a person's going to preach the gospel, says that sooner or later he's going to get into full-time preaching the gospel, and he has to live off the gospel, okay? But the corruption of the church to where all of the people are out there and 90% of them are poor and the, and the, and the preachers a multi multi million is stupid why is that that way everybody in the church should be millionaires after a few years the only reason not because they've never taught the really simple way the father's laid out that he can bless us it's amazing how it works if the ministers don't teach the people to give in faith and believe the word of God to receive. Then they rob God of his ability to bless them. Now, I, as I say, this originally was written to a, a whole conference of bishops, and prophets, and teachers. And boy, were they rebuked just by listening to this word. Because you talk about a soul-sucking soul. Those pastors had one. Man, they're trying to figure out how they can steal the sheep from other pastors and, you know, you know <laughs> give me <a> more. <laughs> because they were starving. And some, uh, half of their families were poor, couldn't even raise it. You know, their kids are going to some public school somewhere that get beat up, all kinds of crazy stuff that, that is not for us at all. Because the devil had been deceiving them in these areas. Okay, so the ministers also should tithe in the principle of it. Here's the thing. My precious Priya gives you the life of Christ that's in her and the operations of the life of Christ that's in her. She's been a giver since the day I ever met her has nothing to do with her upbringing, has nothing to do with her financial status. She just had it in her heart that somehow she knew it. Now, as I'm talking to you about this, you've already known this. It wasn't hidden from you, but that carnal mind kind of deceived you from these things. Okay. She started off, and I know others like her that just started off, and they just started being blessed and getting blessed and getting blessed. And getting, but they kept giving. They just kept giving. Just kept giving. And somehow your little soul just realized, oh, no, I think this is real here. God loves me. Yeah, he loves you. But see, unless you sow some seed, you can't expect a harvest. So let's see how much he really wants you to understand this. Let's go down to the little part called sow and reap. Here is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And the word says this. But this I say, he that sows, sows with a purpose, and his faith goes out of his mouth, and I'm on the wrong side. I don't know, I hope yours are not messed up. Is mine messed up? No. Yours messed up? Uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it is. Is it not? All right, forget this thing, because I know what this is. <laughs> yeah, you can you know, figure it out if you, when you get home. This is what Second Corinthians says. Now listen, I didn't know any of this. After I got saved, delivered, I lived on the streets. Now I had Jesus... Working in power, living on the streets, New York City and in Denver, Colorado, and out around in places in America. And I had no idea about anything of this. I didn't have any religion in me. All I knew is he called me son, and I'm just being obedient every day. Okay? And I went to a meeting, and there was a guy in this meeting for six hours teaching about God's plan to prosper his people for six hours, bringing out all the scriptures in the Bible. 
And I just listened and listened and listened and listened and listened. These three things, tithes, sowing seed with a purpose, and giving alms are his covenant promises by, his, by the blood that we receive blessings. Now see, hey, all of you have experienced and will experience supernatural blessings. They just come to you. You ask the Father, and it just comes to you. That's wonderful. But that's not a lifestyle. That's not something that you're going to do in heaven. You're going to learn how to be like your Father is. You're going to learn how to do something so much more wonderful than this little working that we're doing down here. So these are basic things. So it says that he that sows the seed will reap the seed. And then it says that God will give you seed to sow, and he will multiply your seed that's sown, but don't sow the seed out of compulsion because you have to. Don't sow the seed out of somebody, you know, giving you some bleeding heart problem and oh, uh, no. Where did Jesus tell us to sow seed? Parable of the sower. Wayside, you don't, you don't want seed going on the wayside. Doesn't work. On, on the stony ground, doesn't work. Into the, into, the, into the thorns, doesn't work. In the good ground. What is good ground? Now, I sought the Lord a long time. What is good ground? What is good ground for seed? Good ground is where there is living faith. Not religious faith. Living faith. Now, this brings us into a place to where we're not looking at somebody's situation. Oh, oh poor person. Let's give to them. You know, somebody in the body. We're not trying to figure out what they're dealing with. But obedience to God, he wants to teach you how to hear him to sow the seed into good ground. Now, I told people for years and years and years that Celebration City, World Missions, it was the most fertile ground in the world, and it still is. Don't sow any seed into it. The harvest, the fields of harvest are so plenteous, I don't want to have to deal with all that. Because, see, one little seed, 30, 60, 100 fold, 30, 60, 100 fold for every rupee. This is his covenant in his blood. Now, we're talking about money, right? Now, what do you sow the seed for? See, it's, it's his relationship to you because he loves you. Not because there's a need here or the church needs something. I mean, there's, the world is full of needs. But we're walking to learn about how our Father does something. Looking for living faith. Living faith. And he'll show you. Father, show me where that good ground is to plant the seed. Now, what is the seed that you're planting? It's what you desire. I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. How many of you have had that? Oh, maybe one desire, maybe two. <laughs> See, everything, even in this situation, it's like he's doing some fishing. Okay? <laughs> I love you, sons. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Money is used for material, physical things here in the world. You don't sow money okay? like the Christian religion, different religion, you know, give, give the priest some money and they'll pray for you. you know, I've had people come up and give me envelopes full of money, say, please pray for my daughter. No, not doing that. Money is for, it is seed for material things. What do you have use 
for. Because the rest of that scripture says that he will give it back to you so that you will have everything you have used for with an abundance left over for every good work. Now here comes wisdom. Here's the wisdom to keep you away from greed. Keep you away from bad investments. <laughs> what do you have use for? Wisdom. Not like these crazy people in the world. Got to go get, a, get, get three houses down here on the promenade. You know, got to go on in super, super vacations. I mean, that's all great. But, but they don't have use for that. They're just totally destroying their souls. Now, you might have use for a vacation. I go on vacation, try to get one every year. What do you have use for? The Father says, I love you. What do you have use for? I grew this in my entire, everything I possess, everything I have in the physical world, I sowed a seed for it. Because when I started, I had nothing but some khaki pants and a white shirt and a sleeping bag. That's all I had. The first thing I sowed as a seed was a pencil. That's all I had after listening to this guy preach it. What have I got? Well, what do you got in your hand? It's a pencil. How'd you get it? I asked you for it. Well, there's some faith. What do you think the value of that pencil is? Maybe half a rupee? <laughs> he says, sow it. But when you sow the seed, you have to name the seed. What am I sowing for? Well, I was preaching out on the streets in New York, and there, uh, I just said, you know, man, I'd like to have some kind of portable microphone. So I went to the store, and they, they had a little thing, like a little suitcase, microphone, little little uh, portable microphone, and, and I said, I'd like to have one of those. Well, how much were they? Like $180 back then. So I said, Lord, I just sow this seed for $180. Now, I was listening to this guy all day. I just believed it. That was my step. Two days later, I'm walking down the street, and I began, I sat, and I, I got, these people took me in, in, into a community home, and uh, there was a car out there on the street, and the car was just covered with mud, and the tires were all flat, and uh, the Lord says, I want you to buy that car. Well, of course, my little carnal mind goes, well, I don't have any money. But the Holy Spirit's moving me. <laughs> Like, this is compelling me. You know how it says that Jesus was driven out into the desert? Well, the Holy Spirit was driving me this way. <laughs> and I went up, knocked on the door, asked the guy if he'd sell, he wanted to sell his car. I said, that car is worthless. The car doesn't run. The tires are all flat. I'm going to have the, the guy come by and haul it away to the junk. <clears throat> and I'm going, and I'm thinking... And then all of a sudden, wisdom speaks to me. Tell him that you'll take the car and you'll give him half of the money when you sell it. The guy looks at me like I was crazy. But he did it. He gave me the keys. Okay, so I went. I got a pump. Pumped up the tires. They all stayed up. Cleaned it all off. Cleaned the inside really, really good. Okay? And, and got, a, got a, 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 a used battery. This guy loaned me this battery. Just put it in there, put some gasoline in the thing, and it started right up. I put a for sale sign on it. The next day, a young man comes knocking on the door. Is that your car out there? How much do you want for it? So I'm calculating. Okay, I need $178. Let's just say $150, so I don't have to calculate too hard. <laughs> and so I said $300 because I had to get half of it to this other guy okay. and the kid says okay he takes off comes back with his dad his dad checks it out gives me $300 for the car this was all within a short time see like I say when you're real new at this God really wants you to know how much he loves you and how quickly things can happen okay
But that's not his, that's not, not, that's not the eternal way. That's just, that's just to show you, hey, it's okay. So now you can grow, now you can learn. Okay? And, and so he took the car. Well, I went down the next day, paid for the machine that I had, went back to the man, gave him his money, and I had, I had enough money left over for a McDonald's hamburger and a Coke. That was my first experience. And of course, because God, wow, he did that, showed me how to do it, you know, that just turned me on to having faith in sowing a seed. So everything I possess today, way more than I have use for. He brought me to the place of where I have everything I have use for. I sowed seed for my kids' schooling, for uh, the girls, oh my gosh, those girls. My daughters, got to have clothes all the time. Got to get their hair done all the time. So I taught, them, I taught them how to sow the seed of labor. Mow the lawn. <laughs> Stuff like that. You know, you don't spoil your kids, man. It's, it's bad. Everything. My wife needed stuff. Needed car, needed clothes, needed all kinds of stuff. So when you see something that's in the future, because your seed's not going to pop up tomorrow, those are miracles. Miracles are not the normal way of life in the kingdom of God. It's seed time and harvest. It's life multiplying life. Now I'm going to stop right there. Don't let me forget where I stopped at. When you get to heaven, remember I was telling you about that little ice cube on your leg? When you go out and, you're, and the Lord's not with you, you go out into paradise. I mean, this place is gigantic big. It is so much big. It, it, King David got a revelation. He says God got down on his knee just to look at what he created. The kingdom of God is so big. You see those dead bodies you've been looking at? They are so small. But your soul is increasing in its size in the life of Jesus enough that the entire kingdom will be in your soul just like it is in Jesus' soul. So when I was out walking around in paradise, those creatures, all of them that I met, all of them treated me as though I was a son of God. And I don't, I think they must have thought, maybe they thought I was Jesus. I, I don't know. But if he'd have been there, I'm sure he would, they would have seen that he's more glorious than I am. But maybe not, I don't know. We're express images. But this I do know. They worship you. And they bring tithes to you. And just like that ice cube just went through my whole body, through my head, it was just totally cool. See, you're going to receive the tithe of the increase in the generations of heaven. And they're going to just come to you and you're just going to bring them to the high priest just like you're learning today here. Nobody else has ever heard of anything like this in Christianity ever. Lord had me bring it in about 10 years ago. You picked it up right away. Well, maybe not, but pretty close. But now all the sons that we've got to contact with are learning to do it. Okay, why? Okay, so look. Look. Every day you're going along, doing your deal. <laughs> something gets exposed. Something that's not Jesus. It's not the life. It's something of death and you know it. And you recognize it. And you do what Paul says. If I sin, thoughts, emotions, it's not I, but sin that dwells in me. Well, what do you do with it? Send it to the cross. Send it to the cross. Now, this is an exercise, okay? Paul had to go through it. He just went over and over and over again until it finally started working. And he was hoping that it's going to be so much life in him that he's going to walk right out of that tomb just like Jesus did and be on the earth 
where there's no gravity holding him. You can go through walls, whatever, whatever is, you know, whatever ideas we have about resurrection life in our body. But it all begins with that precious promise of a word. Precious promise. So we have an exercise that we teach people, and it starts with a P, promises. Next word is R for what? Revelation. Next word is I is for identity. And if, if you don't know this, it's not in there. It's not in there. If you don't know this, I'll, I'll explain a little. Because it taught the sons how to look at the word and look for the promises. See, the history of the Bible is not going to do anything for you. It's not going to help you at all. It's history. Okay, it's already gone. You know, in the theological mind looks at history and romance and all these different. But we're we're looking for the life, and your father will talk to you in in the book of Isaiah. You're not going to be reading it from a storybook's point of view like you learned how to read in school. You're going to be reading it from listening to the Father speaking to you and the Holy Spirit speaking to you and different spirits of the kingdom speaking to you, giving you instruction as a son, showing you things, revealing you things. See, the Holy Spirit, you are now receiving the kingdom of God. See, the Holy Spirit is imparting that. Okay. To hear, as the Proverbs says, that you might hear the words of wisdom. In other words, wisdom speaks. How do you know it's not Jesus? You'll know. So faith being the substance of what you hope for. We are an awake church. Right there, that other preacher. <laughs> That other preacher guy. Now, now I'm sowing something, and I'm gonna. I know I'm gonna reap it, but I, I'm prepared. <laughs> the last one we got tithe, sowing seed with a purpose. Your purpose. No, it came up as about I don't know years ago, and I just realized, man, I don't have any joy today. What's the deal? Father, I don't have any joy today. What did he say? Give, shall receive. So I began to walk around. And I began to look past their flesh to see their little souls. And I would go up to them. And I lay hands on them without them asking, Joy fill you. Joy fill you. Drawn it from the vine through the soul that didn't have any. Give, and it shall be given to you. And to that day, I have not, well, to that week and a couple of weeks, I, I'm never lacking in joy. Keep giving more of it. See, the things of the soul, you, what do you want? You, you see something in there that needs to be changed? Yeah. Give what you want to change. Give it. This is how the body begins to learn to build itself up in love. By faith, giving to one another. And don't be afraid of it. You're not being prophetic. You know? What you're doing is sowing what you want to reap. Sowing what you want to reap. So that people come in here, and people come in here sick or whatever, diseased or crippled up, and they'll get healed immediately. Because the, the whole one mind and one accord in doing the work of God. Doing the word of God. Okay? The very presence of it. Okay? So we don't know what part of the body of Christ we are. We don't know what part. And we don't have to care. Because our direction is upward. Into the head. But then at the same time, it's parallel. It's into oneness with the parts of the body that you can see, that you can touch, that you can talk to. Got it? The last one is alms. He that gives 
to the poor, lends to the Lord. Now, countries like this, Africa, America, big country, man, people shun the poor. They shun those poor little creatures out on the street and the little gimped up lady with a little baby coming up to your car. I mean, you know. But years ago, man, I get a stack of bills. He that lends to the Lord Giving to the lens, and the Lord will return it back again. The Lord never returns anything without multiplying it. Lord says, if I give to the poor, I'm lending to you? You mean you're going to owe me? Wow. So we get out around, I get a stack of hundred rupee bills like that. Anybody comes up. Any beggar on it. I don't care what their problem is. I don't care what they think they want the money for. I'm not giving them the money. I'm giving it to God's covenant word. Give to the poor. Now in all of this stuff, in giving, giving from your soul, giving from the flesh, start right where you are. Start where you are. And the first place you start when you're giving, sowing seed with a, is, Father, show me living faith. Show me the good ground. Show me that good ground. And if you see that good ground, that's where you sow it. He that sows little will reap little. He that sows abundantly will reap abundantly. It's the principle of life. Okay. And the day will come. Okay. So in my lifetime, I sowed all this seed for... All of these things. Church sowed tons of seed for all kinds of things that had use for the church as the pastor. Had use for the church. Sowed seed for it. Okay. Sowed seed to be able to come out here in, into India. I remember when we first came to India. Oh, i am tell you, I was, uh, you know, I was a rickshaw, rickshaw rambler. Get out in the village there, I was riding the donkeys. Just to get around. <laughs> Living in the, sleeping on the streets. What, what, what? Why would I want more than that? Isn't that humble? Isn't that the way you're supposed to be? Well, wait a minute. Who's alive in me? Jesus is alive in me. Didn't he already die? Didn't he already die to destroy the power of the curse? Why would we want to live in me under the curse? Why we want to live in you under the curse. He doesn't. He doesn't. So this is how we get out and stay out. And the world can't corrupt us because of the deceitfulness of riches. Rich? See, you guys are already richer than any rich person in the world. What you've got right now is totally massive wealth beyond anything anybody around you's got. Everybody that I know that comes in and out and you guys are going to go somewhere in different places, they go out and, and minister into different churches and stuff, taking some, and they are blown away. I didn't know I had so much life. It's because all them other people got nothing. Those bishops and pastors and prophets and apostles, like, guys, man, they're starving. You know, trying to get something new. Something you're full of life. And you keep it very simple when you're talking to people. How's the simplicity? What you say is the seed of life that will not return empty. It will produce it. So I'm in New York City. And there's this big bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge, all the way across there. And there's a walk. You can walk and the cars go by. And I'm walking along. I'm going to the other side of the bridge. And I'm walking along. I see this guy coming down there, just a normal-looking guy. You know, he didn't have a suit on. Just normal. He's walking along. And as I came up on him and he came to me, okay, his eyes looked at me and I looked at him. And I said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And I just kept walking. I just threw that seed down in them so he had no defense. 
two weeks later in, in, a, in, a, in a fellowship meeting. That's him. That's him right there. That's the guy that, that said that to me on the train. I mean, on the, on the bridge. The guy had gotten saved and somebody had led him into the fellowship. Your words will produce exactly what you sent them forth to do. Don't be afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of their emotions. Okay? They're all dead. Okay? You want a crop, plant a seed. Okay? You got it? Close your eyes. Say this with me. Father, I am a son in your kingdom. Lord Jesus, you are my high priest. I bring you a tithe of the increase of your life in me tonight. Now worship him. Let it go. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Spirit of knowledge. Spirit of understanding. Spirit of faith. Thank you for your increase in us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Now you don't give to someone because of what they look like. You're not going to get any more favor, okay, given to this guy or given to her. Or, or given to that little lady back there in the back. You're not going to get any more favor because you're given to some person that they see that you're given to them. Okay? It's not about that. It's about living faith. And he'll show you. Just stay there and ask him about it. Just ask him about it. Okay? When the church has something, the church has something. You need some more equipment to get another bigger room. More equipment. Okay. And he might, they may, maybe they don't, maybe they won't have enough money at the time. And puts, you know, gives you a little vision. We, we, the church needs more equipment. And, and what is that? That's your opportunity to sow some good seed into living ground for what you want. What you have desire for. After all these years, I have everything I have use for. I'm not even home. Eight months out of the year. God brought a, a, a retired brother, my brother, single guy, up from Florida to live in my house. There's nobody there anymore. Dog died a couple of years ago. <laughs> to take care of the house and take care of the land. And I said, good. And I, I see him. He said, where are you going this time? You know. Sowing good seed, living seed. Okay. Now, you can question it. You might see something and, and, and you don't know. Then you're drawn to wanting to sow some seed. And, and the, Lord, the Lord, you ask the Lord, you ask him. Is, it, is this a good ground? Is this good ground? Is this good ground? Is this good ground? Okay. It's not necessarily somebody you know. It's not because they're rich or they're poor. You're looking for good ground. Jesus found a lot of good ground amongst all of those poor people. Oh, you know, the poor are rich in faith. He found some good ground among them. And most of those guys, after the resurrection, they got saved when the Holy Spirit came down. See? Good ground. Seeds were going in there. Now, I have come to the place to where... I have seed to sow. I tithe. But I'm always looking to give more. Sow more seed. But I came to a place where I said, Lord, I don't, I don't have use for anything. I'm not sowing seed for anybody else. He doesn't, that's not the covenant. The covenant is personal between you and him. Okay. But Lord, I don't have any use for anything. I don't know. If, I, if there's something I want, I just go buy it because I've got money in the bank. What do, I, what do I sow the seed as? This is what he gave me. Sow the seed with the purpose of more seed to sow. That's where I've been for the last five years. 
And no, I'm looking. So that's, that's it. You got it? You're going to rise up. He's going to take you to a place, you know. And here's the thing. He is not judging you for what you want. I mean, if you want a little dinky scooter, sow the seed for it. Start there. That's good. But the day comes you want to get yourself a, a hey, 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 you want to get a Mercedes or a BMW. He doesn't care what you've got. He wants you to know he loves you and that you're walking in his ways. Do you understand? Hey? So that's why we, we look around at one another. You guys start to know one another after the flesh. And Well, this lady's got that, and this man's got that, and this girl's got this. You know, quit that stupid stuff. Okay? But encourage everyone. Okay? And you can share, you know, well, I, yeah, God, man, this week I got to sow, I got to sow, you know, a thousand rupees. Well, what are you sowing for? You know, one of, the, one of those ties that you made for the special ties you made for the movie star guy. Probably cost a thousand rupees or more, huh? More. <laughs> All right, we got it? Thank you.